All right, let's start. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome back, welcome back. Hope you've all had a good uh, good weekend, I guess. You can still have weekends, do you? No, I know from emails you do not have weekends. Uh, always writing. Okay, any questions in, in your minds? Dana? Um, I was looking at your prior video from last semester. Uh huh. And you mentioned that for the space of uh, parts of the lamp and the barbecue case that you don't necessarily, well, they didn't need an external proper um, clause since it was just, was it the commerce clause in a sense? When did I say that? <laughs> it was, I think I mentioned it was because for the um, parts of the Sienta, um, it was... Channels. Channels. Yeah. Right? yeah. And well, the barbecue was the match for Yes. Well, well. well. <laughs> All right, yeah. yeah, so here, let me, let me, let me fill in what, what she said. I, I remember what I said last year. Um, the court in 1964 had two cases one was heart of atlanta motel and the second was cats and vacuum mcclung that was ollie's barbecue okay in heart of atlanta motel the court made a very big fuss about the fact that travelers were coming from one state to the other and they couldn't stop at the hotel because of their race right the court didn't quite say it, but now after Lopez, it makes sense that one of the aspects of Congress's commerce powers is protect the channels of commerce, one of which is literally traveling from one state to the other. I don't remember exactly what I said, but let me tell you now what I think. Maybe it's the same as it last year or not, but I think it is. Um, the entire idea of regulating the channels of commerce really involves both the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, if Congress was actually saying that you have to have highways that can't segregate, that would be regulating the channels of commerce. But here it was an implication of it. It's saying because people are traveling, Congress can free the uh, channels from segregation. So I don't know exactly what I said. Maybe I said it wrong. Who knows? But uh, I think you have to always look at Necessary and Proper. Now, about now, Ollie's Barbecue, that case was different because there were no travelers coming from one state to the other. They relied on the fact that they had uh, uh, ingredients, food coming from out of state. That you definitely need necessary and proper to get there. Okay. So I think part of Atlanta, you could you could possibly squeeze it into just commerce clause. Well, I think you always need the necessary and proper to uh, uh, to wrap it in. Yeah. Um, so even though it was the the hotel that was the issue, um, would be would require them to protect the channel? Or that it's fuzzy. And the reason why and the reason why I'm somewhat hedging is because the idea of the channels didn't really come about until Yeah, Rehnquist really clarified that. I mean you have cases involving highways and the like. I don't know if a hotel is considered a channel of interstate commerce. I don't think it is. I think a highway maybe, um, uh, uh, railroads, um, like a like a like a ship channel or, or a dock or a harbor, I don't know that a hotel counts. Because once you're in the hotel, you stop. You're not in interested in commerce anymore. So anyway, I'm hedging somewhat, but I think you can probably fit into the channels thing, maybe. I'm hedging a little bit. Other questions? So I like the way you're thinking, Dan. A good question. I think you're always, always check me, because I often, believe it or not, I change my mind. Um, <laughs> It's true. I, I often will teach the same case in three years and think, think of three different ways. Uh, and not that one's right or wrong, but different things pop out at me depending on what's going on in the world. I always see things differently based on what's happening uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, and that writing these scripts, which I've given you now to read, has really forced me to think carefully. Um, because when you try to summarize something, you have to do it really precisely. 
and it's actually, I've changed my opinion in a couple of cases this year because of writing those uh, video scripts. Maybe you'll catch me on this, Anna, so please call me out when I do. Uh, okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Basically, I say, let's do a poll question to get us uh, started. Start poll. Okay. Come on. So here is your question. I'll make it a little bigger so you can see it. In Wickard versus Filbert, the Supreme Court upheld the regulations under the Agricultural Adjustment Act solely on the basis of the Commerce Clause. True or false? software. If I hit stop, you see the results, right? Which tells you the, the answer, the wisdom of the crowd is like millionaire, right? I don't say millionaire, remember that show? But if I don't hit stop, you can barely change your answers. So I don't know which is worse. <laughs> Hitting stop so you know the answer, so I can preserve the actual class breakdown, or leaving it running to keep you guys guessing. Ooh. No. I'm going to leave it running, because actually, I would rather you when I call on people, not be sure what the answer is. That, that is more value. And if you guys want to change your answers because you're insecure, uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with this. There's no reason. There's no reason to change your answer. There's no reason to change your answer. I don't agree with this. I don't look at this. All right, so that, 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 I'm going to leave it running, and that's my strategy. And if you don't like it, I don't care. All right, um, so 100% for every question, right? 100%. <laughs> Final answer. Uh, who, who am I up to? Is that you? Oh, no, 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 no. Who are you pointing at? <laughs> 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 Who's next? Start. You'll start. Okay. Oh, what would you, what'd you, what'd you <laughs> put? It's, it's false. Okay, tell me why it's false. Because um, it's based on the Commerce Clause and the Necessary Profit Clause. Okay, so walk me through this, right? Was Roscoe Philburn engaging in interstate commerce, the farmer? Not directly. Okay, but it's a yes or no question, right? Was he engaged in interstate commerce? Yeah. Okay, what was he doing? He, it was just locally, he was growing his own. Very good. He was growing local wheat. Everyone agrees that it's not interstate commerce, right? Okay, very good. So, Tricia, how then can Congress regulate his local um, r raising of wheat? Explain um, to me the process. So, they use um, the aggregation. Uh, aggregation of what? Of um, basically, they said if you take all the farmers that are growing their own, very good, it would have a substantial effect on on um, interstate commerce because those growers would not be going out to the market, and therefore they couldn't artificially control the price. Perfect. Very good. Right. So everyone, okay. Jesus, right. Stop now. Hundred percent. Oh man, ninety, ninety-three percent. Okay, so the answer is false. So a couple of you put true. The answer here is false, okay? 90, 97%, 93% is pretty good. Um, better than 100. If I say 100, then I'll get annoyed, but fine. <laughs> Some people just take it from the team and get it wrong just to, just to put a bunch of right? <laughs> but the answer here is false. And, and then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Uh, sorry, Moniqua. Moniqua. Moniqua and Trisha are exactly correct, okay? The growing of wheat is an economic activity. It's commercial in nature. Right? But it's not interstate commerce. And that's easy. There's no intercourse, there's no channels, nothing, right? It's just one state. However, Congress can regulate not only interstate commerce, but also intrastate economic activity. Again, Congress can regulate an intrastate economic activity so long as that, acti that activity has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And even if one person's economic activity doesn't have a substantial effect, you can aggregate it. So the entire notion of substantial 
It really needs any little effect. If there's even the slightest effect, it's probably going to be swept into Nesser in proper land. Right? And this is what's known as the substantial effects test plus the aggregation principle. Understood? Good? Yeah, Sergio. Oh, you got a little name tag. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Mia, thank you for providing supplies. Um, so, I, so I have a question about your question. Are you talking about how the court explains it? Does the court mention only Commerce Clause and not necessarily Oh, that's proper? a very good question. I, I'm asking you what's the correct constitutional okay. analysis. Because okay. you're right. I mean, what should be driving you nuts? Does, does Justice Rehnquist mention in Lopez necessary and proper? No. Morrison? No. <laughs> In Rach, it does come up because Scalia forces the issue, right? In Rach, Justice Scalia forces the issue, which is why Stevens brings it up also. But in Lopez and Morrison, these big cases, Rehnquist doesn't mention it. Why? It breaks my heart. I don't know why. I wish I knew. I don't know if it's they don't want to talk about it. It's too complicated. I don't know, but it, it makes it harder for you to study. But anyway, so Sergio, know what's going on in the backdrop. We see the words like effect or aggregation. Or, or proper, it's always necessary and proper, okay. right? Let the end be legitimate, it's necessary and proper. If they're citing McCulloch v. Maryland, it's necessary and proper. That's why I think I asked you two weeks ago, was McCulloch v. Maryland a commerce case? No, it was necessary and proper. Whenever you see McCulloch, you know it's MMT. Any other questions? All right, so today we're moving on to the next <coughs> court. And um, I gave you that timeline, oh, let me bring up the timeline. Um, I'll, be, I'll be referring to it today. Oh, let me let me show you the, the animation. Um, uh, the, the timeline is almost animated, but it'll probably be not in time for you to study this topic. I apologize, but I'll show it to you. It'll be a preview. Uh, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be actually pretty cool. I guys, I got this just yesterday. So you know, this is the timeline you're used to, but this this has to be animated. It goes back quick, so, so pay attention. Join me on a brief history of implied congressional powers. And it is, you'll see each column animating one at a time as the case comes along. Yeah, so it, it, it goes so quickly. Here, I'll pause it. Join me on a brief history of implied congressional So the idea is it's going to basically pan the camera from left to right, and as you see, each column will go up one at a time. And what I really want to do is make this almost like a web app they can s scroll left, right, left, right, and in each case, click on it, and then drill down to a particular case. So you can see the entirety, 200 something years, in like one thing, you can you know, scroll like a timeline, left, 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 right, right, right. So that, that's what would be there next year, not for your advantage, but just, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately it's, it's, you know, I love teaching, and I'm gonna love students, not just you, but you get the preview, you get to be the uh, guinea pigs with trial docs. Okay. Anyway, but the idea is we've already had the founding of the Marshall Court, we've had Justice Taney, we've had the Chase Court, Progressive Era, the New Deal, we saw the increase, and then the Warren Court went up. The Rehnquist Court, though, was a period of change. And what do I mean by change? Um, during the 1980s, <coughs> President Reagan made three nominees to the Supreme Court. You had Justice, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist became the chief. You had Justice Scalia, you had Justice O'Connor, and then you have Justice Kennedy. Now, Justice Kennedy and O'Connor uh, are often known as uh, moderates or swing justices. Uh, and That means they're not quite conservative, they're not quite liberal, and they would often go different ways on various social issues. But Justices Kennedy and O'Connor were fairly consistent in their visions of federalism and the separation of powers. Um, so even though Justice Kennedy wrote these opinions on gay marriage and gay rights and other things, he was extremely consistent on separation of powers cases. And as was Justice O'Connor, even perhaps even more so than was Justice Kennedy. So we have three cases decided, or actually, well, the latter three cases, Lopez, Morris, and Rage, in which Kennedy and O'Connor would often go with conservatives, sometimes they would switch to the other side. But this period, the Rankless Court, was designed to um, not reverse the New Deal, as is often thought, and this, this graph illustrates it. The purpose, I think, of the Rehnquist Courts was basically, all right, we've gone this far, um, but we're not going any further. The way Randy says it, this far, but no farther. 
So what the Rehnquist Court tried to do is put um, breaks on the New Deal case law. Right? They weren't trying to get rid of the New Deal, they were trying to just pull it back. And that worked okay in Lopez and in Morrison. But you'll see in Raich, uh, it sort of went the other way. And Justice Stevens got Justice Kennedy to go along with it. And when he did that, he basically opened the floodgates. Uh, Raich is often called the marijuana exception to federalism. Because uh, uh, Scalia and Kennedy uh, you know, went along with the majority of that one, kind of. But I want to first talk about South Dakota versus Dole. This case doesn't really fit anywhere. Um, it's there mostly chronologically. Uh, but it will be very important when we discuss the Obamacare decision on, um, on Wednesday, right? When we do Obamacare on Wednesday. So the Constitution doesn't actually have a spending clause. You'll see everywhere, Congress's spending clause, the spending clause. There's no such actual provision. Instead, we have the very first provision, Article 1, Section 8. It says Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general wealth of the United States, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, Danny, what does that provision mean? Just read it for you. What does that provision mean? Okay, so what, what's a tax? Well, what's the purpose of a tax? Well, that's an easier question. To collect money in order to spend. Very good, right. What's the purpose of a tax? To collect money. And what do you do when you collect the money? Well, you don't save it, you spend it, right? That's what government does, they spend money. Now, Danny, here's a harder follow up question. What can Congress spend money on? Okay, so this was in the video. I hope you guys picked up on this. In the very early years of our republic, I mean, like, very beginning, there was a very big debate between Hamilton on the one hand and Madison on the other. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Same as necessary and proper. There were so many debates between Hamilton and Madison in the first couple of years. And in almost every case, Hamilton won. It's remarkable. I mean, it's, it's stunning. You call, Madison's called the father of the Constitution, but Hamilton won almost every debate. So there were two interpretations, right? What can Congress spend money on? And Danny says they can spend money on anything that promotes the common general welfare and the common defense, which is pretty broad. And that was what Hamilton argued. Hamilton said it's a very broad power. Then you have Madison. And Madison, no, 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 you can only spend money uh, on what's necessary and proper to execute what's in Article 1, Section 8. So they can spend money on post offices, they can spend money on coining a, a, a money, they can spend money on regulating commerce, but they can't spend money on anything else. Why does this make a difference? One of the key ways that Congress has increased leverage over the years is by giving money to the states. You might call it bribery, you might call it inducement, you might call it generosity, call it whatever you want. But Congress has been very effective of giving money to states with strings attached to it, right? It's like, hey, you want this money? You gotta do something for it. We can't make you do this, but if you want this money, here, with a string attached to it. So if Madison was correct, right, if Madison was correct that Congress can only spend money on what's in federal power, then South Dakota Bill has to be wrong, right? Then there's just no money to bribe states to raise a drinking age. But if Hamilton's correct, that they can spend money to promote the general welfare, well then, that could include states increasing their drinking age. So at the outset, Danny's correct. The correct, well not the correct way, but the Hamiltonian way of reading this, this provision is Congress can spend money on what promotes general welfare. Get with me so far. All right. Relation to the state, isn't that the police power of the state? I'm sorry, sir? Isn't that the police power of the state? Isn't it? Right. It is. So then, what's the, so then what are the limits then on the spending power? Well, I think it would have to come to the Ah, OK. So now, now we're getting to gold. That, those are the four, the four factors, right, which we'll get to in a minute. But at the outset, the court in, in Dole and also in some earlier cases called Darby goes with Hamilton, that the states can get money from the feds with strings attached to it. 
right? So there's no question under modern doctrine, at least, that if Congress wants a state to um, build a highway of a certain width, they can say, we'll give you money for this highway as long as you build it to a certain width, that's fine. But then why was Dole different, right? Why was Dole such a controversial case? Carrie, what, what were the facts in Dole? Um, so you have South Dakota who allows um, those who are 19 years or older to drink. Yeah, light beer. Light Anyone beer. ever have this light beer? Um, and so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't drink, so no. Um, and so Congress enacted um, basically a statute that says that if they do not raise it up to 21, that they'll withhold certain funding for uh, transportation. Well, so what funding for what, specifically? Um, federal highways. Very good. Okay, thank you, Carrie. So Congress has this genius idea that they want. We need to stop drunk driving, right? We need to stop underage drunk driving. We need to stop minors from drinking. Right, which one is it? Wait a minute. Oh. We need to stop drunk driving. Well, no, we not quite do that. We need to stop underage drunk driving. Well, it doesn't do that either. We need to stop underage drinking. So we see, right? The what Congress is doing here is not saying you can only drive drunk at the age of 21, right? <laughs> That's not what they're doing. They're saying you can only drink when you're 21, but does this law in any way impact drunk driving? Not directly. Because, in theory at least, if a person can't get alcohol to the 21, and a person's driving at 18 or 17, then they're not going to be able to drink while they're of driving age. And there might be a decrease in underage drinking and driving. Everyone with me, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Marcus, you next? Did I call you in the last week? Yes. I'm going to throw these guys in the box. Okay, Marcus. So, what's the what's South Dakota's objection to this um, to, to, to this to this law? Right? Why why can't they just decline the money? Right? You know, they don't want the money. They don't have to take it. Well, you know, let's. Um, you don't want to take the money. Yeah, Keep your drinking age of 20 at 18 or 19. No, I, no, I know I know that's what they said, but just, just one minute. <clears throat> Why can't they just turn down the money? They just turn down the money and say, we don't want it. And then why do they have to go to the Supreme Court for this? Why can't they just turn away the money? Because they're already they're using it. Oh. And they, they've been receiving it for so long. And they didn't want they to. Didn't want to throw it out. They want to lose the money. Okay, so everyone heard what he just said, right? He's exactly correct. Of course the state can turn away the money, but they really wanted it, and they were relying on it. So the argument was, we've been accepting this money for some time, and now you're changing the conditions on us. And we become, what's a good word? Dependent on the federal dole. Not dole, no pun intended, right? We become <laughs> dependent on the federal, this is a different word, it's much worse. Uh, the federal payments, right? The, the federal bail, whatever you want to call it. All right. So then they said that it's unconstitutional to impose this condition. Now, uh, did my thing fall? It oh, fell. Okay. Kristen, yeah. thank you. I knew it was a K. I was thinking, I forget it. I will get to the answer. Kristen, what provision of the Constitution did South Carolina say? This law violates. Um, the Tenth Amendment. Okay, now here comes the follow-up question. What does it mean for law to violate the Tenth Amendment? Um, that they're imposing on states' rights. Because if it's not and if it's not a power given to Congress, then it's given to the states. Okay, very good. That's actually the correct answer. That's, that's the exact correct answer. Do I have the tenth amendment up here? <laughs> what? No, you're right. Oh no, I, I, this case is not it was easy for me, so I was It's worried. a hard case. No, no, but you're, Kristen, you're exactly <coughs> correct. So go to 10th Amendment, right? I forgot to put it on the screen, but you have it in your books. 10th Amendment. And it says, let me just try the page when we have it. Okay, page 69, please. All right? It says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Okay. So the argument here is this, and actually Marcus tipped on this before, 
who has the authority to set drinking ages? It's the states under their police power. Does Congress have the power to set drinking ages? No, they don't. Okay. Therefore, the power is reserved to the states. But, and that, that's usually what Kristen is right, but not entirely right, that doesn't end the inquiry. Yeah. Take it back. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't end the inquiry. There's more to it. Right? Congress can't force the states to raise their drinking age. But the question is, what provision does this condition in the spending bill impose? Right? Why does the spending condition violate the Constitution? And the answer actually, you're, the answer to the 10th Amendment is a little bit different. Yeah, so you're trying to take a step? Right? Why does the spending condition run afoul of the Constitution? In other words, what, what exactly, what clause does this violate? This is not one of the enumerated powers? It's not enumerated power, right? Marcus, you want to add something? No, I was going to say it's uh, not for the general welfare. Oh, but it is, though. That's Hamilton. Hamilton said general welfare. But okay, let's go back to Sergio for a minute, right? Sergio, I think, is basically right. Just so Connor, even though she has her dissent, right, did she really say a provision violates the O'Connor dissent? Does Justice O'Connor say what clause of the Constitution violates? Mm -hmm. so it's a little bit vague, right? A little bit, a little bit wishy. Okay. Aaron, you have to. I thought it was suspended. But, but but that's Hamilton, right? So so, you're if if you guys are running in circles, I'm letting you. Right? There's not a. There's not a perfect answer to the question I'm asking. I think Kristen's right, and the 10th Amendment's probably the best answer. But the, 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 the big picture is that Congress simply lacks enumerated power to impose the spending condition. Right? That's the answer, and the 10th Amendment reflects it. But why they lack this power? The answer, I, th I think, has to be that the, 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 the definition of general welfare that O'Connor adopts is more narrow than the, general, the definition that the majority adopts. So I think she has a more narrow understanding of the general welfare, right? But it's not at all clear. And then we did the reading for the Obamacare decision. Um, you're also going to see it's not entirely clear what exactly runs about. Yeah, Kristen. Okay, this is just from going through the Constitution. But isn't it also one of the amendments that has to do with the transport of alcohol? Like it's reserved for the Ah, state? okay. It's also the Twenty First Amendment, yeah, right? That's so there's a, so. Let me do this now because it's not really relevant. But go to the 21st Amendment. <coughs> I'll give the page a shout it out. What page? 82. 82. Okay? So we all know the 18th Amendment was prohibition. Right? The 18th Amendment was prohibition. That was repealed by the 21st Amendment. Okay? The 21st Amendment says the 18th Amendment is hereby repealed. We only have section 2. It says the transportation or importation to any state for delivery or use therein in violation of the laws thereof is prohibited. What does that mean? If a state violates, I'm sorry, if a state prohibits alcohol, it's still illegal. What, what does that mean? Anyone here live in a dry county? Or come from a dry county? Dry county? Do you know why these dry counties still exist? I just like this uh, the state actually turns the power over to the local government. Right. So the states retain under the 21st Amendment the power to regulate alcohol. And they give to the local counties the power to make dry counties. But now, Mark, you, you lived in a dry county? Yes. On the border of the county, was there a liquor store? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason why you have dry counties. I, I, I can promise you, whoever owns that liquor store lobbies to keep that county dry because they get a monopoly. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> but the, the court is never exactly clear what about these conditions violates the Constitution. It's a very vague thing. We can go through it. We will in a minute. But just, you know, that textually, this is not rock solid, right? It's not, it's not entirely clear. Uh, all right, so Clay, walk me through Rehnquist's analysis, right? Why does Chief Justice Rehnquist think that this spending provision is, is, is fine? Limits. 
spending power. Yeah, good. Okay, well, what are these four limits? I, I, we can start there. Uh, general welfare, unambiguous, related to the federal interest and other constitutional provisions. Okay, very good. So, Chief Justice Rehnquist says, look, we are sticking with the Hamiltonian understanding of general welfare, but there are these four limits. Wait a minute. Hamilton said general welfare, and that's it. So you see what Rehnquist is doing. He's saying, we're going to stick with the New Deal precedent, Hamilton, but we're going to put some limits on it, which is actually fairly important. So he puts four limits, and actually a fifth one, which we'll get to in a minute. But Clay mentioned there are four limits. So first, the spending must be pursued of the general welfare. That's Hamilton, right? He's saying we're adopting Hamilton's understanding that Congress can spend money on federal issues and they can spend money on state issues. That's number one. Um, number two, Congress must make the conditions unambiguous. What does this mean? If Congress wants to impose a condition on the state, they must do so clearly. There must be no doubt, no ambiguity about what the condition is. <coughs> Why? They don't want to have surprises, right? It's not like you give someone some money and say, oh yeah, we'll give you money today, and then five years later you add a new condition to it. They have to have an unambiguous condition up front. Okay? Then comes the third one. This is where I think O'Connor and Rehnquist disagree the most. By the way, they dated. Uh, O'Connor and Rehnquist were in... They went to law school together. Oh, this is a, this is a good poem. No, it's not. They went to law school together at Stanford, and they were in the same class. And they briefly dated. Now, here's the rub. Rank was graduated first in his class. And he went to clerk at the Supreme Court. O'Connor, I think, was third in her class. At the time, there were not many women in the profession. She couldn't get a job as a lawyer. So they, were, they remained friends. They were always friendly. But they did date briefly. Uh, and I'll give you one more. <laughs> I'm not covering this case this year. But there was a case in the 90s called, uh, what was it called? Uh, uh, Reno versus ACLU which involved regulation of pornography on the internet. And this is when the internet was brand new. And Rehnquist and O'Connor were quite old at that point, and they didn't know what the internet was. They had no idea. So I'm not joking. <laughs> they had the librarian roll a computer into their chambers and illustrate how easy it was to obtain porn on the internet. Oh, God. <laughs> and this was the 1990s. Now, who was clerking? There wasn't porn. Oh, you know, oh, it gets better. Who was clerking for Rehnquist that term? Ted Cruz. And he wrote in his biography that he was there watching as Rehnquist and O'Connor were, were, were basically scanning porn on the internet. <laughs> and apparently O'Connor said, I said, I said, O'Connor really said, oh my. That's <laughs> So, and, and, and check the case. They actually wrote a concurring opinion saying, we're very, we agree with free speech, but it's very easy to get this stuff on the internet. They didn't quite know. Not, now they know. Anyway, so they have, they have some history there. Uh, <laughs> I can't unsee it. No, uh, Here. Hail to the chief. There it is. There it is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to ruin your night. Uh, <laughs> oh, poor choice of words. Um, <laughs> no, okay, I'm done. Sorry. So, the, the four conditions, the third condition, <laughs> the, third, the third condition is that the condition might be legitimate if it's unrelated to the federal interest in particular, right? They don't really tell you what this means, but that's related to some federal interest. Basically, everything relates to a federal interest. The fourth one, is there some sort of independent constitutional bar? This is, Kristen asked me a minute ago, the 21st Amendment is not a bar here, right? So those four factors, Rehnquist goes through fairly easily. The fifth factor, though, he doesn't really call it a fifth factor, but it's a fifth factor, is his point. He says, the condition might be unconstitutional if you cross a line, if you cross a line. If the financial inducement offered by Congress is so coercive to pass the point at which pressure turns into compulsion. Pressure turns into compulsion. Janice, what on earth does that mean? Pressure turns into compulsion. 
Well, that would mean they. I know. I know it's been. I know they turn Pressure out, turns to compulsion, right? So, so for example, they said if you don't give us, if you don't raise your yeah, drinking age, right, so we will, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, the so basically would be that um, I don't want to say they're desperate for the money, but you know they really need the money. That they're basically um, they will acquiesce to uh, whatever regulation come out just so that they can get some money. So then it definitely is. For so a so in this case, Janice, how much money was being withheld? From Five percent. Five percent of what? The transportation budget. I think it was. Is that a lot? No, well, no. They actually don't say. No, they don't really say how much. No, and I I've, I've checked. It's actually not much. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, exactly right. I've actually checked. It was a fairly small amount. I've done the numbers. It was actually was an amicus brief in that case authored by John Roberts, and he was writing a brief on the alcohol lobbies, and he actually did the math. So it was, it was a fairly small number. It was, it was either in the hundreds of thousands or the low millions. It wasn't a lot of money. I mean, thoughts, right? But, but the government, you know, a drop in the bucket. Um, so what Rehnquist says, by the way, uh, Roberts clerk for Rehnquist. Is uh, but what Rehnquist says is that uh, this is not coercion. In other words, the state still has the ability to say no to this money. That's why I asked Marcus a minute ago. Why can't they just turn down the money? And Rehnquist says, look, they turn down the money. Okay, they get a slight reduction in highway funds. They wouldn't get the test, right? But here comes the, here comes the, the issue, right? How much is too much, right? At what point does mere pressure turn into compulsion, right? Where is that line between pressure and compulsion? The court doesn't identify with any specificity. Uh, you're not going to find a law that, that crosses that line until we get to the Affordable Care Act, which we'll cover on Wednesday. I'll give you a preview. Um, in the ACA case, NFAB versus Sibelius, states that didn't expand their Medicaid programs stood to risk losing all their Medicaid funding. And that could be you know, 15 or 20% of a state's budget. So we're not talking losing 5% of highway funds. You're talking losing 20% of a state's budget. And in the Obamacare decision, Chief Justice Roberts says that you cross the line from pressure to compulsion. Right? And he gives this very funny analogy, which I'll, I'll mention now. Right? There's this old, uh, old comedy sketch where a burglar goes to someone and he puts a gun to your head and says, your money or your life? The guy's thinking, he's like, what are you doing? Your money or your life? So I'm thinking about it. Right? <laughs> Do you really have a choice if someone says, your money or your life? There's no actual choice. And Roberts uses that to uh, uh, describe the Obamacare uh, Medicaid uh, expansion. But under the Rehnquist opinion, you have these four factors, which don't really, need, don't really matter, they're always satisfied. And then you have the fifth factor, which could be violated, and indeed was in the Obamacare decision. Okay, so any questions of the Rehnquist opinion, majority? Uh, Amir, are you next? Okay, Amir, what's O'Connor's dissent? What does O'Connor talk about dissent? Um, she objects to the application of the third factor of relatedness. Okay, tell me, how, why does she object to the relatedness factor? She feels that the condition, the 21-year-old uh, driving condition, is not directly related to the purposes of the act. Directly related? Does a majority require a direct relationship? No. Yeah, just in the ballpark, right? Basically, the majority says, well, Drinking age relates to drunk driving, and drunk driving relates to highways, so close enough, right? It's in the ballpark. But, How would O'Connor connect it? But she said if it's just limited by Congress's notion of welfare and not true relatedness, then there really is no limit. And she right. would connect it by having, she said, um, basically, they can say how the money is to be spent. I think you already touched on this. Um, so like, <coughs> like, if you spend the money on highways, but you can't give the money and have the string not be immediately tied to that. It's not sufficiently related to highway yeah, construction. Exactly. Exactly. So Connor would have a relatedness test. That the money can only be given to do what the money is given for. If the money is for building highways, they can impose conditions on how highways are built. They can't go outside the ballpark and say, aha, change your drinking age. This was often called the germaneness, right? Germane. The connection, right? What's the connection between the money being given and the condition? 
Connor, this is too far. The third factor relatedness probably goes back to how broadly she reads general welfare. I think that's where she hangs it. You know, we can argue about that. But I think it fits in that she's basically saying Hamilton may have gone too far. He usually did. I have some questions. Yes, yes. Ma'am. She said um, that basically it was uh, an exercise of regulatory power, not spending power. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So spending power should not be regulatory? Well, so. Congress can, for example, can regulate commerce among the several states, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can Congress regulate a state's drinking age? Apparently. Mm, no. Can Congress <laughs> pass a law that straight up regulates the drinking age? Um, no, not directly. Find the question. Yeah, it's very good. They can't, right? So Congress says this is not actually a spending provision. This is a secret regulation, right? They're dressing up a regulation with a little bit of money, right? They're taking a regulation of state drinking age and they're just dangling a little bit of funds, like a little carrot. So as long as they call it highway construction? Yeah. If Congress had passed the same law and said, we'll give you zero dollars to raise your drinking age, it would be unconstitutional. But by dangling a little bit of money, they can basically transform an unconstitutional statute into a constitutional statute. Understood? Okay. So we have the questions on Lopez. I'm sorry. I'm going to reach out to you next case. Uh, on Dole. Right? This was an important case, not so much what it held, but about the fifth factor, which was triggered then you know, 30 years later. When I went to law school, we didn't have anything. When I went to law school, it was, okay, with this dull test, never been crossed. But now in Obamacare, we have that line crossed. I started teaching three months after the Obamacare decisions. So it's always remember exactly where it was. You'll get, you'll get the story on Thursday, on Wednesday. Okay. Anything else? All right, we'll go to the next case. Um, in case you're wondering, Dole was Elizabeth Dole, not Bob Dole. It was the wife of Bob Dole. Bob Dole, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and she was the Secretary of uh, Transportation under President Reagan. Uh, okay, so now we come to Lopez. Can you go to Edison High School in San Antonio by chance? I had one year one student actually went to Edison High School, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, so we have this case. Uh, you, all, you want to give me the facts on Lopez, please? Sure. <clears throat> so Lopez was a, a soccer player, athlete in the high school? He was. I actually, I, I have a very blurry picture of him. I apologize. Someone sent this to me, like, a decade ago, and he, he took it on his camera phone. Back then, camera phones weren't very good. Uh, so that's a picture of Lopez, and um, here he is playing soccer. Again, it's a really bad picture. It's, a, it's the best I got. I suppose I can go to the high school library and get a copy of the yearbook. Maybe I will shoot someday, but anyway, that's him. All right, go on, Noel. And on a, on a rumor, um, the school found out that he was carrying a 38 caliber handgun mm -hmm. and he went ahead and admitted to it yep. that he was carrying. By the way, always tell your, oh, how many teachers are here? Any, any teachers? I get in trouble. Whenever I go to a high school class, I say never tell them anything, don't confess to anything, don't tell teachers, don't tell principals, don't <coughs> tell them nothing. And I get in trouble, it, but he confessed, mistake number one. <laughs> so don't confess to anything, talk to a lawyer. Even the worst of the parents, like, Parents says, tell the teacher what you did. How to make them confess? And he confessed. They say, well, I did it because there you go. <laughs> Learn. All right. So now, so 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 he confessed he had a gun. What happened next? So uh, then the he was charged under state. Very good. Charges. So initially, the state, you know, Texas state law prohibited guns in schools, right? Okay, then what happened? And then the state immediately dropped charges. Why? Because the federal government stepped in and... Now, why would Texas not go ahead and prosecute this kid for bringing a gun to a school? Why would they hand over to the feds? I mean, that's not, it's not, not, that's not in the book, but why do you think the answer is... Texas? <laughs> oh, oh, because... Um, As a general matter, why would the states decline to prosecute a crime and turn over to the feds. It's an easy answer. The, there's a higher um, penalty punishment. And? Say it. It's free. 
right? For the state to prosecute Mr. Lopez, they'd have to pay for it. To incarcerate him, they'd have to pay for it. His probation, his parole, rehab, if to the feds, is free. The state's gonna credit for arresting the guy for bringing guns to a school, and it's free. So this is common, right? It's very often the case that the feds just hand over a drug case, they take over a case, and the states can go in. Now, Quinn, you are Mr. Lopez's lawyer, right? You're, you're a federal public defender in San Antonio, which man? Some of you might be defenders one day. It's a good job. By the way, people say, I want to do constitutional law. You want to do con law? Become a public defender. You do fourth and fifth amendment stuff every day of your life. It, it's not everyone that's worked for the ACLU. There are other things you can do. So, Quinn, you're the lawyer for Mr. Lopez, right? You're his attorney. And he's, he's guilty, right? He admitted to his principal, Marcus got out of him, right? He admitted to his principal <laughs> that he had the gun in school. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt. So, you're his lawyer. What do you, what do you recommend he do? Oh. Well, he admitted, so I don't know. Uh... Well, usually when someone admits to a crime, what, what, what do they do? What, what, how do they proceed with the, with, with the case? Like a plea bargain? Yeah, they take a plea, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you generally take a plea bargain, which means you, you confess guilt in open court, and then you accept a reduced sentence. And public defenders are very overworked. And I don't say this as a criticism, but they're so overworked, it's not possible to take every case to trial. It's often not a good idea. Because <laughs> if you go to trial, you look at a higher sentence, right? He may have been looking at, you know, maybe probation, maybe a year in jail versus he went to trial maybe five to 10 years. And this kid, what, 18, 19 years old, you young kid. So, Quinn, what's your advice? You say take a plea bargain, go just go home? Well, yeah, that looks like the option. So is that what happened here? No, they didn't try it. Not a chance. Oh. So the public defender, right, rolled the dice. Um, his name was, oh, God, what was name? Jack something, Jack Carter. Uh, I actually emailed a guy a decade ago, never replied, so who knows if he's still even around, but I want you to think very carefully. Right there. You have a client who's guilty, right? He broke the law, he admitted it, and he's facing a stiff sentence. He could have just as easily said, um, you know, Mr. Lopez, plead guilty and, you know, he'll be out in about a year or two. Uh, but he decided to push forward and challenge the constitutionality of his law. Now. It's very easy for me to sit here today in 2018 and say, of course, Lopez, right? Of course, challenge the, challenge the law is unconstitutional, but Lopez wasn't a thing at this point, right? It wasn't a case, and the Supreme Court had not invalidated a federal law as beyond Congress's power since like 1936, right? Going back to a Schefter poultry or thereabouts, right? We're coming back 60 years. But this defender did something I think that was very smart. He said, look, I have a case to make. He didn't ask to overrule, you know, Wickard. He didn't ask to overrule Heart of Atlanta or the Cats and Bat case. He came up with an argument for why these cases are different. And that's why I make you study the timeline the way I do. It's not enough to know what the law is in a given point in time. You have to understand the progression. And he understood the progression well. He had good lawyering, and please don't. Public defenders overwork, but they, they do very good work. And they did good work here. They got their guy off. Well, they didn't actually get him off, but, but you know, they at, least, uh, they at least got this one guy, this one conviction tossed. Okay? So, uh, Vincent, what was Lopez's argument for why bringing a gun to a school was beyond, or why the gun free schools on that was beyond Congress's power? What was his argument? Oh, man, let's see. Um, what was the argument why this law, this gun free school zone act, was beyond Congress's power? Um, because it, uh, I don't know if this is his actual argument, but it uh, doesn't regulate any commercial activity. Ah, okay. So let's just be very carefully, all right? Vincent's right. Okay. Vincent, what exactly was Congress regulating in Wicker? Be very careful. What was Congress regulating in Wicker? Wicker, that was the Wicker Kilburn, that was the uh, the wheat farming. Very good. So what yes. was Congress regulating in that case? That, that case, they were, uh, they were regulating the, 
basically amounts to uh, the form of the wheat. Amounts of wheat. The production of wheat. Yeah, yeah, but but the actual act, what was Filburn doing? So you said he, he was he was he was producing too much wheat. He was making wheat. Okay. Was the production of wheat an economic activity? Yes. Okay. You all agree. Production of wheat was some sort of economic activity. And if you look at Wick, Wicker, they say this over again, economic activity, economic activity. All right? Michelle, is merely possessing a gun in a school zone an economic activity? No. No, why not? Merely possessing a gun, economic activity. Well, I know that they say that um, they didn't make any findings on how it connects to. Okay, we'll get there in a minute, right? But it's just the, the basic question Is the act of merely possessing a gun an economic activity? Well, according to the Webster definition that they give on economic. Well, but you could be Rachel Lopez, right? Oh, I did skip to Rachel. Yeah, right. another Webster. Right, right. right. wrong, wrong case. Okay. Then, uh, under? Oh, under, under Lopez is merely possessing a gun an economic activity. I know it's not a But what's an economic activity? Does the court say? Lopez? I don't think they... Mark, your hands been up for a while. Um, I would say no, because it just doesn't have an effect on the economy overall. It's the mere possession of gun. Okay, so good. So, in Lopez, right, the key move in Lopez is they put a limit on what is an economic activity. Right? Merely possessing a gun, the court says, is not an economic activity. Right? You can only aggregate economic activity. Right? If one person grows wheat, and the second person grows wheat, and the third person grows wheat, then you can aggregate economic activities that have a substantial effect on your economy. But because possession of gun is not an economic activity, you don't get the aggregation doctrine. Marcus? But I thought in that case as well, you got the aggregation doctrine by anything you could possibly do. This is a limit that Rehnquist put on it. What Rehnquist says here wasn't clear in Wickard, right? He's basically adding a layer to it. He's saying that Wickard only spoke of economic activities, and it did, it uses those words. And he's saying, because possessing guns on economic activity, then you can't regulate it. Now, that's not the only way though, right? Uh, my. Yes. But couldn't Congress say that we have a strong interest in eradicating um, gun violence across the country, right? And that if we allow one person to have a gun in school school zones, and then everyone in the school zone has a gun, then there's gun violence. Could Congress regulate it that way? It's not any power that's given to them under Article One, Section Eight, or neither Commerce Clause or the Accessory Clause. What do people say? There's a, there's a broader scheme, or a broader regulatory scheme. It has to tie back to and become a city of the year. Okay, I think, I, think, I think we're on the right track here, right? So Rehnquist suggests that perhaps if Congress had a regulatory scheme, right, a broader regulatory scheme, then Congress could reach these sort are of local activities. But Congress has to make findings to that effect. And Congress failed to make any findings of how the mere possession of a gun relates to economic activity. Now, 
Why did Congress not make any findings? It's fairly easy, right? If Congress had put a few sentences in this bill, it would have been fine. And indeed, Congress reenacted the Gun-Free School Zone Act with a couple extra sentences, and it's on the book still today. That even though the court said that the uh, Gun-Free School Zone Act was unconstitutional, <coughs> they basically reenacted it with findings about how the local possession of guns has substantial effect in interstate commerce, and as part of a broader regulatory agenda, they can regulate this. But because you can't bootstrap this with necessary and proper, you only look, is this some sort of economic activity? The answer is no. What drives me nuts, though, is that Rehnquist doesn't talk about necessary and proper. It, it drives me crazy, which is why the analysis is a little bit iffy, right? It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not airtight, and it, you're, you're saying, wait a minute, but I thought they can't regulate any non-economic activity. This won't become clear until rage, which is why I teach them one after the other. But the holding of Lopez, right? The holding of Lopez is that possession of a gun is not an economic activity, and Congress didn't make any findings for how this has an effect on interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Rehnquist also gives this acronym, or I, I call it the acronym, but these three factors, right? <coughs> I call it CIA. You have the channels, you have the instrumentalities, and you have effect, right? I didn't spell that right. Activity, activity, not I'm sorry, activities. Yeah, thank you. I always forget the third one, right? Okay. You have the channels, you have the instrumentalities, and you have uh, uh, the activities. Um, these, I think, are fairly helpful uh, to a degree to illustrating the various things that Congress can um, regulate, okay? So the channels are things like highways, roads, and the like. These are, these are the sorts of conduits that are used uh, uh, for interstate highway, ports, railroads, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I flipped it. Let's get these. Let's get these flipped. I'm sorry. I described the instrumentalities. The, high, the, the highways and the railroads are the, the instrumentalities. The channels are also basically ways that commerce flows. So the reason why I get these confused, the channels and instrumentalities are basically the same thing. I don't see much of a difference. I always get confused in my head. But these are the means by which interstate commerce goes about. Uh, the third one is the activities that substantially affect interstate commerce, and this is liquor, as well as Darby. What is it it? So, <laughs> he refers to channels of interstate commerce and instrumentalities of interstate commerce. They're the same thing. I, I, I always get confused. So, Randy, Randy thinks they're different. I, I don't. Uh, he describes them as uh, the local activities that block the flow of interstate commerce. So, for example, if a hotel is segregated and doesn't admit certain patrons, that's blocking the channels of commerce. Whereas the instrumentalities are the roads and the railroads. I, I, yeah, I, Randy thinks they're different. I think they're the same thing, whatever. Um, if you want it, you can take it. But I think they're basically the same thing. The one that actually matters is the third one, which is why the first two are largely irrelevant. Right, the third is, are those uh, activities that a, a substantial effect interstate commerce. But the key point here is that the Gunfrey School Zone Act has nothing to do with commerce. It's not an economic activity. And once, because it's not an economic activity, you can aggregate them together. Yeah, again, this limit was not in, in, in Wickard. You could derive it from Wickard, but it wasn't in Wickard directly. Okay. Yeah, Karen. I'm sorry, could you explain what channels were again? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> not, not for you. It's, it's, okay. I'm going to just read what's in the script. I think it's silly. Okay. okay. He cites Heart of Atlanta in the opinion, right, for channels. And he doesn't say what they are. He says, you keep the channels, which is a commerce free, from immoral and injurious uses. What does that mean? Activities that might block the flow of interstate commerce, such as a segregated hotel. Again, I. Okay. Okay, Chief. 
He tried to make it seem very easy and straightforward, but doesn't really explain what these things are, which is why students always get angry at it. Every year I have like, I don't know how a channel is. I always, <laughs> yeah, Mark, yeah. I hate to like harp on this part. Okay, please. But, but because he cited part of Atlanta yeah. and Darby, can't we just say that channels could be like restaurants and... Well, what was Darby though? Darby was not Lumberjack. <laughs> <laughs> right? If it was just part of Atlanta, I'll say fine. Hotels, but Darby was about what they rented the wages of Lumberjack. What the heck did they do for the hotel? I don't, I don't know. That's why this is still always trying to skip over until we all. So I don't know. Yeah, Darby was about Lumberjacks and, and the wages of people cutting wood. Mm -hmm. And part of Atlanta was about a segregated hotel. Okay. Whatever you say, Chief. You always call him the chief, as you just call him chief, that's what they call the chief justice, the chief. All right, I have the questions on Lopez. So when Lopez was decided, it was like this, this like bomb that was dropped on like constitutional law professors. Like, oh my God, there are limits? For decades, professors taught their students that there are no limits on federal power, and that was probably an accurate statement of law. But then in Lopez, they said, ha, there are limits. Now, would this case have any impact on anything else? Again, Congress, enacted the law with like three extra sentences and it was on the books, it was fine. So Lopez had a very trivial impact on reality. It made almost no difference in anything practical. The next case though, actually had some impact. And the next case, signal that the court was actually serious about enforcing the separation of powers. Uh, Tim, you wanna give me the facts please in Morrison? Yeah, take your time. Uh, sure, Are there questions here? Oh. One, one time. You, me just, or Karen, who was next? I didn't want to beat the horse. Um, I had that request said that instrumentalities or commodities transported through channels, persons or things in interstate commerce, including what he said about even um, threats from interstate activities. And so, I had champion be aims down, so like lottery tickets would be instrumentalities. Is a person a commodity? Uh, the last, one of the cases we read last week said that person's going through, yeah, like person and personal property. Yeah, I, I, I can pull it. Yeah, I mean you're not you're not wrong. I mean it's. I mean that was the one where you asked if, if they had expanded the definition of commerce. Yeah, I mean. The reason why, I mean, so they cite like Darby and they cite part of Atlanta. I think it was Darby, Atlanta, that's it. it's a it's it's a weird it's a weird juxtaposition, right? If you're talking about commodities, okay, lottery tickets. Then you have the wages of the lumberjacks, and you have people driving through hotels. It, it's a broad swath. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such a broad category; it's almost meaningless, right? So that's why I don't I don't you can harp always always, always harp. Um, but so but. So are persons? <laughs> exactly. Are persons come up? Is a person commercial activity, right? It's a very. When it's convenient. But you said you're the same for the exam, you're the right? So you want to say you can say it. Yeah, but I mean, it just for my own for my own sake, it's a very. The channel category is a very weird one. Because <coughs> it's like he's trying to. Rank was trying to group together things that don't like really fit. Remember, like you take the square peg into the round hole, and he just jammed it in there. Right? It, it's, not, it's not a good fit, but. Yes. Yeah, that's a problem. I'd be on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you guys decided that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back to Morris. Uh, uh, it actually. Oh, we're not done. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, Karen, give your hand. I'm sorry. Um, I they had a lot of concurrences and dissents. Yeah. Is there something in the central that you know about those? Um. It doesn't matter. Really. Yeah. Lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's so many notes in this. Uh, all the dissents are fair game. All right, we, we don't want to talk about dissents. <coughs> right, so I go back. Fair game. I don't even remember what you're I didn't know I had a bunch of stuff. Like on the exam? Yeah. I'm sorry. The, oh, absolutely. Concurrences and dissents are always fair game. Always. Um, in fact, the reason why they're in there, the reason why they're in there is because they're giving a different perspective. And often, the concurrence and dissent makes a point the majority doesn't respond to. You'll see this a lot. Um, it's very often the case that majority makes a, a, a statement, the dissent responds to it, and the majority just ignores it. What do you do with that? What? <laughs> no. 
one is a majority today might become a dissent tomorrow. And what's a dissent today might become a majority tomorrow. So very often the seeds planted in dissent can become a majority opinion years later. Also, if the, if the dissent says, here's a really big error in the majority and they ignore it, that's flimsy. I'll, I'll give you uh, one, uh, one second. Justice Kennedy uh, retired, you know, actually a couple weeks ago, end of, end of July. Um, one of his least desirable traits was that when he wrote a majority opinion, he got his five votes, he didn't care what the dissent said. Right? He would write these very fluffy opinions that one loved to read, had no, had no merit, no weight to them. And the dissent just eviscerated them, just shredded apart. Okay, he's gone now. Okay, he's gone now. When you don't have an actual response to dissent, there's nothing keeping that dissent as dissent might become majority opinion. So the failure to engage in dissent uh, is problematic. Also, concurring opinions are just as important because they signal alternate ways of ruling that might be uh, uh, persuasive to lower courts. They can go further. So well, it seems like all three cases completely ignore um, Justice Thomas's relentless uh, <laughs> insistence on removing the substantial effects test. Yeah. I mean, constantly Good. he's saying yeah. that. All right, Tim, so I'm going to have to unfortunately come to a different Hello? question. What is Justice Thomas's oh, concurring? Janice is, is, is giving me another question. So, what was Justice <laughs> Thomas's. Oh, she said it. What is Justice Thomas's uh, position in, in his concurring opinion? Yeah, um, well, and he starts off right away in his introduction saying that the court needs to further temper the Commerce Clause jurisprudence. Um, and I, I love how he phrases it, it, so it's more faithful to the original understanding of that clause. What does that mean? Uh, basically, he wants to go back uh, earlier in time. He feels that the court has expanded the Commerce Clause too far. Okay, let's go back to our timeline, right? Where does Justice Thomas want to go? Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you can't be on the court. That's what, that's what he <laughs> Well, I think maybe maybe around here. Yeah, probably probably thirties, probably probably thirties. I don't know. Yeah, I think Justice Thomas and also Justice Scalia are uh, self-professed originalists, which means they try to ascertain the Constitution's original meaning. And for Justice Thomas, the word commerce has a meaning that's much more narrow. Though the court says it means today, it refers to commercial interaction. Um, so he would narrowly construe the Commerce Clause to, act, to actual commercial up, commerce inter, intercourse, and he would kill the substantial effects test, which I think brings us back to around E.C. Knight. I don't know if it goes back to Hepburn or DeWitt, but probably around to E.C. Knight, back to the turn of the century. Yes, sir, sir. No, he, he did say, if anything, the wrong turn of the court was in the 1930s. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think he'd go back to the 1930s, you know, mm -hmm. around maybe. Hammer versus Dagenhardt and E.C. Knight. I think he would maybe stop at Chuck to Poultry. I think that'd be the last good case uh, in, 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 the, in the timeline. So he's not coming back all the way, Janice, but at least from the 1930s. <laughs> E.C. Knight was 1895. Yeah. That's a decade here or there, among friends. So Thomas <laughs> makes his point in every opinion. He does in the Obamacare decision. In every case, he says the same thing. We need to go back. Uh, and let me tell you something. You know, Justice Thomas gets, I think, a bum <coughs> rap uh, because people say, oh, he doesn't ask any questions. Um, he is one of the most thoughtful justices. His opinions raise things that others simply do not. Um, he raises points that others don't, and they usually ignore him. But who thinks about it? The law students, law professors, right? You have to, because they're in the book. And the ideas he raises eventually trickle down and can influence lower court judges. Or more, a significant number of Justice Thomas's law clerks are now federal judges. He's having an effect that I think he's probably the most underrated justice of our era. I mean, others get credit, but he's very much underrated. I was just going to say, because I hear him in articles that said that he's probably going to be one of the more influential justices. Without question. Without, I don't know about most influential, but definitely most underrated. People don't quite appreciate him. For years, we think, oh, he's a Scalia clone. <laughs> in some respects, he was more courageous on these sort of issues than Scalia was. He was more out there than, than Scalia was. Look at Rach, right? Thomas dissented, Scalia didn't. So, in some cases, Thomas was leading Scalia. Uh, remarkable guy. Uh, you know. Scalia tricked him. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> he, he was on his own. He was on his own. And now that Justice Scalia passed away, uh, Justice Thomas every writes the most opinions. The most opinions. Because he writes concurrences for basically everything in dissent. He writes a lot of separate writings. 
Nothing, very few 5-4 cases, he's had only a handful of 5-4 decisions he wrote, but he's usually on his own. And often when he gets a 5-4, he loses the majority, and then he has to, you know, it, it gets a mess. Oh, that happens, right? Sometimes an opinion will be assigned, like in Obamacare, and then the authorship changes after the writing of the opinion. So Thomas doesn't always keep his 5 fours. He's very consistent on his principles. Okay, so that's the Thomas one. Um, let's talk about, is Briar in your book? Yes. Let's talk about Briar for a minute, right? Is, he, is a Briar concurring opinion in your book or no? Oh, no, Lopez. Oh, I'm sorry, Descent. Briar's Descent. Oh, yeah, let's talk about Briar for a minute, right? Here's what Briar says. Briar says, this is an easy case, right? If there's guns in school, people are afraid. And if people are afraid, they can't study. And if they can't study, well, they're not going to do as well in school. And if they don't do well in school, well, they won't get good jobs. And if they don't get good jobs, that will impact the national economy. QED. Right? We're done. But Leo, what's, how does the majority respond to just Breyer's reasoning? What, what's wrong with that, 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 that line of reasoning? I'll come back to you, Samantha. What, what, what's, how does Justice Breyer, or how does the majority respond to the, the Breyer reason? I think they follow that reasoning then on this page. Basically, you get a return from the public Perfect. Every word you said, say one more time, please. Say the last phrase one more time. Uh, if they follow that reasoning, Congress could build inference on top of inference to control, I think it was everything, anything. She's exactly correct, right? So the majority says there has to be some limiting principle, right? We have a government of limited enumerated powers. It can't do everything. Under the Justice Breyer inference upon inference, if this, then this, then this, then this, there are no limits. If you can reason backwards from a gun in a school zone to a national economy, there's no limits. So the majority rejects this inference upon inference. Now again, Wicker, right? If one farmer does this, and two farmers do this, and three farmers do this, was that not inference upon inference? Probably, right? So again, the Breyer dissent, I think also the Stevens dissent, they're basically saying, what the hell happened, right? We have Wicker. We have the New Deal, 1936, it happened, and the majority is trying to run away from it. Brank was like, no, no, we're not running away. CIA, right, we're doing everything consistent, um, but very clear, the majority is saying we're not going any further, and we're going to start putting limits on the scope of the New Deal. Yeah, Mia. Um, so the rational basis that kept getting quoted everywhere, yeah. where did it come from? So, we haven't done the rational basis test yet. We'll do this when we get to the due process clause. What the rational basis test generally means is that courts are not going to second guess a decision by the legislative branch. That if Congress thinks it's rational to ban guns to protect the national economy, then that's it. It's a very deferential standard review. The majority has never actually adopted the rational basis test. Although I think it was mentioned in Heart of Atlanta. If you look at your notes in Heart of Atlanta, or maybe it was Katzenbeck, they mentioned rational in basis. Rage. I know it's in rage, but I'm saying in, in, in Heart of Atlanta, up to this point, right? Okay. Up, up to Lopez, <laughs> they haven't actually adopted it. Justice Stevens, I think, does, and then the yeah. Obamacare, they basically ignore it, right? <laughs> so there's often, often bickering about this, but in um, the dissents say, as long as Congress has some conceivable basis, they can regulate. This is the inference, by the inference approach. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good, very good catch. All right, anything else on the dissents? I don't have time to do everything, but I, I don't want to. I don't want you to feel that I'm leaving stuff out. If someone feels compelled to talk about the dissents, I'd be happy to. <laughs> They're important. They're there for a reason. No, Mary, don't don't apologize. You can't. They're in the book for a reason, right? Yeah. Look, Breyer makes points the majority doesn't really respond to. He makes some points the majority has a feeble response to, and by pointing out how feeble the response is, it undermines the strength of the majority. Right? If Justice Ginsburg would always say this, she would say that, you know, Justice Scalia drove her crazy, but when he dissented, it made the majority opinion stronger. She would always say this that when there was one case where uh, Ginsburg had the majority and Scalia was going to be in dissent, and she sent him the opinion in advance and said, hey, take a look. And he just sent her back this barn burning letter, and she made her majority stronger. 
right? There's one opinion that she always makes fun of. She wrote, it was a case involving um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Virginia Military Institute, we'll read it later, and she says, like, on the Charlottesville campus of the University of Virginia, and Scalia says, there's no Charlottesville campus, there's only one University of Virginia, he thought there. I mean, a real big fuss, and she, she still brings that point up. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Miss what? I miss Marshall where it was just one person talking. You didn't have to go through all of these. <laughs> well, that's a good point. Right, with, with Justice John Marshall, one person wrote. Yeah, one person wrote. Go back to Chisholm v. Georgia, five. All right, Ellie, you want to go? Give me the Fox and Morrison, please. Um, well, from the video, right, because the, the book just mentioned, it just says going into uh, yeah. the popularity of. Oh, give me the Fox and Morrison, please. Yeah, from the video from wherever. There was a woman who took her case to the federal court uh -huh. regarding the Violence Against Women's Act of 1994. Okay. Um, regarding um, she was raped by two students at Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so as a general matter, right, when you have crimes of sexual violence, which level of government prosecutes them? As a general matter. State. Right. The state is generally the one prosecuting rape charges, right? Mm -hmm. Was there any state prosecution in this case? No, no. Okay, now, the backstory of this is that the two guys who assaulted her were football players. <clears throat> and apparently, the, the school slapped the guys in the wrist. They got like, maybe suspended for a game or something, something pretty trivial. So, you have a situation where the state government has failed to provide the protection of one of its citizens in terms of this, of this, of this rape, right? So she relies on this new federal law. And again, the federal law was not a federal criminal prosecution. Okay, you're next. Okay, yeah, good, perfect. So tell us, uh, Adrian, right? Yes. Adrian, so what exactly did the Violence Against Women Act do? What, what did this law create? So it, it gave them remedy for the victims um, that were victims of the gender motivated. Uh, Very good. Violence. And where were they sued for this remedy? Um, you mean location? Yeah, which court? Um, were they suing in state court? No, federal district. Uh, Very good. Uh, Very, so Adrian's correct. What Congress said is that if someone engages in an act of gender, excuse me, gender motivated <coughs> violence, that the victim, and not just man on women or women on men, it goes both ways, right? Any gender motivated violence, the victim can bring a civil action in federal court against her assailants, right? That it creates a federal court jurisdiction over domestic violence, not criminal, civil. And why does that matter? Well, in this case, she was suing for damages. Now the case is actually called United States versus Morrison. Morrison was one of the football players who was uh, involved. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, oh, she stepped out. Uh, Kyle, who do you think Christy Broncalo is? Uh, no, Christy Broncalo is the asylum. Who do you think Christy Broncalo is actually interested in? <laughs> football players? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the school. school. Virginia Tech. Deep pockets, right? She wanted to go after the school, she right? Had the football players. <laughs> The football, the, the football players were sued, right? But you also brought suit against the university. Why? Money, right? Deeper pockets. Restitution. As far as I can tell, the football players never went pro, so they probably don't have any, any money. Now, there's a problem here, which we'll study later. Can you sue a state institution? Generally, no. No. Under the 11th Amendment, which we'll cover in about a week or two, you can't sue the state university. But through the VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, Congress basically waived the state sovereign immunity. And we did Chisholm v. Georgia, right? Congress waived the state sovereign immunity. So part of this decision, that's why it's kind of chopped up in your book, part of this decision is that the court held that Congress couldn't waive Virginia's sovereign immunity. In other words, you couldn't sue the state. Okay? But the part that we're reading today is, can Congress create a civil cause of action for domestic violence. In other words, can Congress regulate domestic violence, local gender motivated crimes? Okay? Drew, 
what the court hold here? Um, they found that uh, that is uh, Tell me why. Uh, here they said that uh, they rejected the argument that Congress may regulate non-economic violent criminal conduct based solely on the conduct as it affects. So, um, well, so, so is the act of rape, right? Is that an economic activity? No, Okay, very good. So Lopez follows from Morrison, right? Lopez follows from Mar Lopez follows Morrison. Lopez said that merely possessing a gun is not economic activity. Morrison says gender motivated violence is also not economic activity because it's not economic activity. You can't then go to aggregation, right? You only go to substantial effects in aggregation with economic activity, and because it's not economic activity, you can't aggregate it. So even if people being uh, having gender crimes in every state in the union, right, coast to coast, has an effect in interstate commerce, it doesn't matter because the actual act of gender motivated violence is not itself an economic activity. And that's actually Chrissy Brancala. I think we put a video of her uh, talking at a press conference. <laughs> now, the court here, I think, is a little bit more clear than Lopez. Five years had lapsed, and they got a little bit more time to think about it. Now, what the court says here is that we can't give Congress a police power. That the role of policing gender crimes should be for the states and not for the federal government. And allowing Congress to regulate domestic crimes and gender motivated violence would obliterate the distinction between national and local authority. If Congress can regulate this, they can regulate anything. There is no limiting principle. And family law, murder, these sorts of things are reserved for the states. So questions on, on Morrison. Questions on Morrison, right? The key, the key holding is <coughs> a gender motivated crime is not an economic activity, therefore you can't apply the substantial tax test to it. Yes, so on the video you talked about Joe Biden had specifically added language about ah, Homer. Yes, let's talk about this. Um, well, well, so and actually, Joe Biden was the big sponsor of this bill. They added findings. Oh my God, so many findings. All these findings about how gender motivated violence has a substantial effect in interstate commerce, right? Why were those findings, Trisha, not relevant to the court's holding? They said it wasn't persuasive. Well, precisely, but more than that, persuasive. What do you need in order to go to the aggregation principle? Economic. Exactly. The threshold question, if it's not economic activity, you don't go the aggregation, right? If there's not economic activity, you can't aggregate. What they didn't defer to Congress is gender motivated violence economic activity, right? Congress said, basically, that the act of engaging in gender motivated violence is itself economic activity. They would not defer on that point. And Randy has this one point in rage, which I'll, I'll bring up now. Um, you know, what's the difference between uh, was it marital relations and prostitution, right? <laughs> oh, sorry? Yeah, he made that in the Supreme Court, right? It's the exact same act, right? Intercourse, right? Today, today is one of those days, right? It, it's an intercourse. The actual, the other intercourse, right? The, <laughs> actually, it's intercourse commerce. <laughs> oh, actually, it is. <laughs> oh, intercourse commerce. I mean, Marvel said it was intercourse. They should respond to that one, right? He said that. But as a general matter, <laughs> as a general matter, though, it, the mere act of engaging in, in, in some sort of violence crime, that's not economic activity. And even though there were findings about substantial effects, because it wasn't an economic activity, you don't get the aggregation. So those findings are largely irrelevant, right? But yeah. Congress tried to patch things up, and they tried to say, oh, we have all these findings, and they weren't enough. But anyway, this will be short-lived. We'll get to rage in a minute, and none of this really matters anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry? 
But isn't that only for pot? Well, it's for pot, but not broccoli. <laughs> so, so wait, before we move on. Yeah, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. Oh, oh, ask, okay, because okay, with this <laughs> this new line of um, case law, starting from Lopez. Yeah. Um, so if if the activity is is not economic, not economic right? activity, okay, right? So there's no aggregation, so you cannot. There's no substantial effect. Okay. Exactly. So. It completely, totally disregards the necessary and proper clause. Yes. And remember what Janet says, right? If you don't have economic activity, the necessary and proper clause just falls off because you don't get the substantial effects test. So where are they getting the economic? The definition the, of economic activity. Well, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no. I mean, even if yeah. you take um, Justice um, Thomas um, at his uh, explanation in Lopez and talk about the, the textual um, um, the interpretation of the, mm -hmm. of the Constitution, there is no economic, in the, in the Commerce Clause, it doesn't specifically talk about economics. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's why this is all a joke, right? Let me explain why. The majority is doing what Thomas would like to do, but they're not saying it. Right. Okay. Let me, let me just. There put is this. no substantial. Right. The Constitution has a substantial mm -hmm. effects clause. The Constitution has no economic activity clause. What the majority is saying is, we know this entire New Deal stuff has substantial effects still garbage, right? But we can't overturn it because it'll be too, 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 too monumental. So we're going to take words in these 1930s decisions and use them to make this new test. I said again. This is, this is Randy's theory, and I think it explains it well. He describes it as originalism's gravitational pull, right? Where the majority agrees with Thomas, right? They say that Thomas is right, commerce is a much more narrow definition, and substantial effects has no basis in law. But they can't say that. So they try and come close to it and make up these other sorts of tests that approximate the Thomas dissent, but don't go so far. By limiting themselves to economic activities, they're cutting off the substantial effects test. Because once you're limiting yourself to what's an economic activity, you can't do aggregation anymore. Right. So mm -hmm. Thomas says, just get rid of the test altogether. The majority says, well, we'll limit where it applies. So it's not going full Thomas. It's only going partial Clarence, right? They're going you know, half, <laughs> not even half, <laughs> you know, maybe a quarter of the way. But I think, I think your, Janice, your observation is very astute, right? The majority in Lopez and Morrison probably agrees with Thomas. But they can't say that out loud, especially Scalia. Scalia will not go that far. <coughs> so they make up this other test that says, well, if you look at Wicker, they talk about economic activity. Okay, we'll limit ourselves to economic activity. And they get to Obamacare, aha, these cases spoke only of activity, but we have inactivity. That way we, we can't regulate it here. So they take words in these old decisions rather than going back to the actual text of the Constitution. They do this, this sort of dance around it. So they make the law more uncertain. I mean, it, well, but what it does is it lets Stevens do what he did in Rach and go to Webster's Dictionary and find this and broad find definition, definition and basically undermine all of Lopez and Morrison. Right? This was a good five-year run, six-year run. Yeah, this is incredible. But once you get to look, once you get to Rach, Stevens gets the majority. They define co economic based on you know Webster's Third Dictionary, and then everything's economic, and then you go back to substantial effect. So the the purpose of Lopez and Morrison was to narrow the scope of economic activity so you don't go to substantial effects, but then in Rage they expanded it and you go everything to substantial effects. So it was a good run, five or six years, whatever it was. Interesting. Yeah, Mia. So the Lopez case, they harped on the commercial versus non-commercial. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the economic, economic yeah. versus non-commercial? Yeah, versus yeah the language is imprecise, but he's talking about economic versus non-economic. And, and that the court decides what that is. Yeah. But again, once you get to reach of Webster's Dictionary, was it bartering, selling, commodities, it's basically everything, right? Oh, one at a time. Yeah, yeah, Janice? It's almost like Kennedy has amnesia and Scalia has amnesia <laughs> because they're agreeing with... with yeah, um, well, well, so, well cause Scalia doesn't join the majority. He says, well, I kind of do, but not really. Kennedy joins in full. Was it because it was we? I mean, was that... Yeah. I mean, so, so, so this is going really off the grid, I suppose. Apparently, Justice Kennedy's brother died of some sort of drug overdose, and he has a very soft spot for drugs. It, it, it's often called the drug war exception to the Commerce Clause. That's something I refer to the case. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, uh, it, it did something to the case law. But then you get to the Obamacare decision, and they make this other distinction about the activity with inactivity. So it's not a consistent line.
It's what, sorry? It's just something else. I mean, they're kind of cuckoo. Cuckoo. Well, I mean, it's respect. not. <laughs> if, if they're trying to, yeah, I mean, they're not, it's not consistent if that's what's bugging that's what's yeah. bugging you. It's, it's hard to reconcile the Kennedy vote in Lopez and Morrison and then to Rage. It's really hard to reconcile. Yeah. Scalia, I think we'll talk about his story for a bit. He does something very, I think, important, but he doesn't go along with the Stevens' opinion in full. I heard someone else's, yeah, Marcus, patiently. This is my personal understanding. So uh, all of the uh, uh, numerated powers in Section uh, 8, mm -hmm. that's totally related to the Constitution. Well, not all of them. I mean, not all of them, right. But they, they, which one, I mean, economic activity is all about commerce. Right. Okay. Okay, so that would be the second power, the second enumerated power. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right. Other questions on, Mo on Lopez and Mars? Mm -hmm. uh, anything on Lopez and Mars? All right. Then we get to 2003, um, Gonzalez versus Rage. Um, as you know, oh, it's like a little cartoon effect where he's like talking in little bubbles. You like that? That's my idea. I hope it, I hope it works. But it's, the problem is, he, Randy talks very quickly, so we actually have to like slow it down a bit, like in certain breaks, if you can tell. You actually chop up the audio so it's easier to understand. Uh, but that was his first case, and he the case argued the Supreme Court. Big deal. He lost. Uh, <laughs> he got three votes. He, yeah, he got three votes. I mean, he was maybe expecting four. Yes, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, yeah. You lose more than you win usually in that court. Okay. Uh, who am I up to? Delbert, are you next? Patiently waiting, that's right. Uh, you want to give me the facts, please, in Gonzalez versus, and it's pronounced Rach. Rach, right? T C H. Rach. 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 Okay. So, uh, in the 70s, Congress passed the Comprehensive Control Act. Good. They use what? Whoa, what do you mean legal marijuana? Legal under state law. Right, so. Go on, go on. You're doing good. Very good, thank you. So, we now have, I'm sure someone knows this, how many states have legal marijuana? How's the number? Three or four. Three or four? It's a hand. Ten? Are you talking about medicinal or recreational? Yeah. Medicinal, it's only 20. Yeah. It shouldn't make a difference, but, but you know, a, a sizable number of states in the union have decriminalized marijuana for one purpose or another. It really makes no difference if it's medicinal or not. It doesn't make a difference, right? So a threshold question. Uh, what's your name? Jason. Jason. Are states required to criminalize marijuana? Or any controlled substance for that matter? No. Are states required to criminalize marijuana? No. Can Congress pass a law telling states you must criminalize marijuana? Want to say yes? I think HPD on your shirt, right? Well, but <laughs> <laughs> what did we learn today? Can Congress pass a law telling the state to raise your drinking age? No. So can Congress pass a law telling the state that they must criminalize pot? It's economic. No, 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 no. Can Congress pass a law ordering the state you must pass a law to ban pot? No. No, they can't. What can Congress do instead? 
here. I can do a door. What they do here? Passed uh, Control Substance Act. <coughs> okay, and what's the effect of the Control Substance Act? What's it, what, what's the effect of that law? Uh, categorize the legal drugs in different schedules. Sure, but what happens if a state decriminalizes marijuana? Does it matter? It does. How? Well, because. In other words, let me put it this way, right? Let's say California gives you a license that Jason can have medicinal marijuana, right? And then the feds show up and say, we want to raid your plants. You say, aha, I have my state ID card. You can't take my plants. What happens then? They're not gonna, that's not gonna fly. Why not? Why, why, why are the feds not gonna listen to your state card? Because it's, it's federal law. Which is? It's illegal. But so federal law is blank over state law. Federal law is blank over state law. What word? Federal law is supreme over state law. So if the states say, we'll give you a card to grow marijuana, and the feds show up, that's nice. They're going to take your plants. And that's what happened in Reach, right? Feds showed up, they raided the pot plants, and they didn't care that they had license under state law to grow the marijuana. Okay. So this case involved a challenge to the Controlled Substance Act. But again, Randy, and he, he explains this in the video far better than I could, but Randy wasn't challenging the power of the state to regulate drugs altogether. He wasn't saying, we think that the entire war on drugs is unconstitutional. I think it, but that wasn't the argument in the case. <coughs> Instead, he challenged a very specific application of the Controlled Substance Act. A specific application of it, right? He says specifically we're challenging locally grown marijuana, locally grown marijuana that never travels in interstate commerce. The seeds are local, the plants are local, the rolling paper is local. No, uh, every oh. actually she's a vaporizer. I mean, she, she, she has a half there. She, she's a vaporizer. Uh, <laughs> Medicinal. I, I, I have never used any, I'm actually, I'm basically Mormon. I've never used any drugs or anything. That's true. Never, never touched it. Uh, Jewish, but, but I, I, actually, I don't drink, I don't smoke, no coffee. I'm basically Mormon. So, um, <laughs> so the point here is this. This marijuana never traveled in interstate commerce. So what is Congress's ability to regulate it? Right, so Jessica, what was the government's argument why they could regulate this locally grown marijuana? Well, they couldn't really, well, they, I think they tried to use the aggregate principle, but then they said, no, that's not going to work. Um, but it's like a, a model substitute for, so anything that they're growing within California is like a replacement for what they would have got from someone else. Very good. So this is what, what they call the market substitute theory. And the video, I think, explains this far better than I can. Um, if Angel Rage uses this locally grown marijuana, then she doesn't need to buy from a dealer on the street. She's substituting her local pot for a marijuana that might come from another state, or perhaps from Mexico, or perhaps from somewhere across the border, right? But the threshold question, right, uh, Jesse, the threshold question is this. We only get to aggregation if there's economic activity. Is the growing of marijuana economic activity. Is a, is, a, is, a, is a growing of marijuana economic activity? That's your question. Yeah. 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 Wheat or weed, right? <laughs> I, I had a chapter in my book called Wheat and Weed, and tell us about. Or grain and ganja work both ways. <laughs> I consider both as child. Anyway, Jesse, is growing of marijuana, cannabis, if you will, is that, by the way, do you know Mount Vernon's grown hemp now? I don't apparently George Washington grew hemp back in the day. It's I know not, it, it's not I know it's it, 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 it's very low level yeah. of THC. Yeah. Very very it's not none, it's just a very low level. Uh, not enough to get you high. So uh, Jesse, is the growing of marijuana economic activity? Jesse. Yeah, it's economic. Why? 
why is the growing of marijuana, according to the majority, economic activity? It's, it's a very good question. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so there was a three-hour standoff supposedly, but nobody talks about that. Oh, between at the at the at the yeah, marijuana. So after a three-hour standoff, the federal yeah. agencies, and this is a lady who's in her bed. So. Right. <laughs> this lady's what? <laughs> I said it doesn't look like she was participating in a standoff against. The um. And it was six plants. It was six plants. Yeah, I, I'll ask Randy about it. I actually, I know the details of the stand up. I'll, I'll take your word for it. For six plants. I mean, this is like the craziest I thing I think it was um, the two ladies that brought the suit, and their that actually raided the other ladies' house. Yeah, it was actually Monson's property that was raided. Diane didn't grow it. Uh, Angel Rage didn't grow plants until Dan Monson did. So I don't know the specifics of the raid. I'll ask Randy about that later. Oh, yeah. Okay, but back to Jesse. Jesse is. Is the um, you had plenty of time to think about it now. So is the <laughs> is the growing of marijuana an economic activity? Yes. Okay, why? Um, because it the economic activity the production and consumption. Okay, so production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. Commodities. The production, distribution, the consumption commodities. And where does Justice Stevens get that from? <coughs> Webster's Third Dictionary. By the way, there, there's a backstory here. Justice Scalia hated Webster's Third Dictionary. He hated it. He, he has a copy of Webster's Second, not anymore, but he had a copy of Webster's Second on his dictionary. He hated Webster's Third because it changed the way that language is being defined. And he would always complain whenever someone cites Webster's Third, he would like dissent from that point because he would not look at Webster's Third Dictionary. He hated it so much. So Steve was just rubbing it in. Why did Stevens pick Webster's third? It had the broadest definition of commerce, I'm sorry, economics you can think of. It was the production, distribution, what was the third one? I always forget. Consumption. Consumption of commodities. <laughs> production, distribution, consumption of commodities. Now, Glennis, is, use, is carrying a gun in the school a consumption of a commodity? Sorry? Sure. Why not? What's consumption mean? Use it. Use it. So is bringing a gun to school consuming a commodity? It doesn't require a fire. Most people, most tech people have guns, never actually use it for others. Mm -hmm. So would, under Justice Stevens' definition of economics, would Lopez have gone the other way? Yeah. Probably. Mars and harder call though. I, I don't know that gender violence is that even a commodity, and I think you can try to make that be very strong. Um, so, arguably, if the Lopez definition, I'm sorry, if the rage definition of economics is used, Lopez goes the other way. Because this was a gun that was purchased somewhere, right? The gun was probably manufactured in another state, parts moving around, and you're consuming it, you're using the gun in the school. Gun. So, Arguably, if you take this broad definition from Webster's Dictionary, Lopez goes the other way. Morrison probably not, but Lopez does. But what Justice Stevens tries to do with the Webster's Dictionary is cut off the Lopez-Morrison pathway. It says, we have this very broad definition of what economics is. So virtually everything is an economic activity. And once you have an economic activity, you apply the substantial effects test. Right, once you get to economic activity, substantial effects, aggregate away. If all these people buy local marijuana, they're not buying in the interstate market, therefore you have an effect in interstate commerce. Right, that's the, the upshot of reach. If you go back to our timeline, whatever limits Lopez and Morris are holding down, reach goes further. And again, reach I think is further than Wicker. Right? Why? Wicker doesn't really define what the economic activity is. At least Wicker left open what an economic activity was, and Lopez tried to keep it narrow. Right? However, once you get to rage, you open the door. <coughs> and virtually everything is economic activity, except if it's not activity at all. That's the Obamacare case. Kanisha, oh, you patiently waiting. I think I skipped you before, I'm sorry. You do, but I don't have my question. You want to try again? Yeah. Oh. 
Okay, I'm sorry, Mitch, I, I, I got distracted. Um, so if the, if the bottom line is that you have a broad definition of economic activity, yeah. and once you determine that you have economic activity, you, decide, you apply the um, substantial principles, right. you don't really have to apply to it. No, once you once get, you determine you're, you're home free. Then you're done. There's right. no to apply. So once you get past the economic threshold, you're home free. Everything else, is, everything else is, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. So you keep defining the activity as So the act you're doing the judgment there, right? If the yeah. only question is, is it economic activity? Then once you get past that threshold, there's no actual judgment. Yeah, and if Stevens has this broad definition of economic, there's no, there's not, there's no test, right? Yeah. So then, is there a limit now after reach on what federal power can accomplish? Define economic. No, 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 no. Define economic. No, economic means Activity. anything. But what's the limit following rage? They said anything's economic activity can regulate it. Then there's no limit. Oh, so what about the next case that says five months later? Mm -hmm. Well, ah, okay. Let's say, say, yes, uh, Brooke, say, say. So let me put it this way, right? The same way I told you a few minutes ago that Jack Carter, the lawyer for Mr. Lopez, is smart. People read the rage, said, aha, after rage, there's no limit. It was a law student. So they had Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. And he wrote a student note for the law review, right? And he explained that after rage, Congress cannot regulate inactivity. This was 15 years before Obamacare was even a thing, right? He said, Congress can't regulate inactivity. Then years later, we got to Obamacare, said, aha, I have this article already written. And that was the basis of the Obamacare challenge. So even after rage, there's still something Congress can't regulate, inactivity. But that's the same thing. If it's not, I mean, if, if it's activity, regulated, period. Why do I need to go to inactivity? Because if it doesn't fall in inactivity, I don't need to do all that. Well, clearly, if, if you're obviously supposed to be 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 we have to say, aha, here's what the opinion says, here's what it doesn't say, and you put it different. And move on. Okay, move on. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> so we have here the majority opinion in rage basically cut off Lopez and Morrison. Almost anything under Webster's dictionary is going to be an economic activity. And once you get to economic activity, you can aggregate away and get to the get to wherever you need to go. Now, I want to talk about Justice Scalia's concurring opinion. Marquis, are you next? So Scalia has a very weird opinion. He says, "I agree that the Controlled Substance Act cannot uh, can be applied to the uh, respondent's activity, but my analysis is was it if not inconsistent, at least more nuanced. What the hell?" Uh, Scalia is being really cute here, right? This is, again, the drug war exception to federalism. You could tell Scalia was very uh, uneasy about this. He, he, didn't, he didn't want to do this, but, you know, it's sometimes the heart goes one way and the, and the brain goes the other, I suppose. But he tried to have an alternate ground, right? So, um, Marquia, what's Scalia's analysis for, the, for his concurrent rage? Um, I was actually thinking just like you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you still 20 years later. Yeah, it seems like he was basically saying that Congress has power with the Commerce Clause and then also the Nuclear and Commerce Clause and what's going to be in the U.S. But specifically, does, does, does Scalia adopt the Webster's third definition, the Webster's de de definition of economics? Um, it seems like he's relying on the substantial effects. Um, okay. But how does he get there? What, how does he get to the necessary and proper clause? Um, I guess because the goal of Congress is to, they have like a regulatory objective, and so the necessary and proper is what. What, what, is, what is Congress's regulatory objective? Let me ask you that question. Well, well, well obviously, there's an access impact that makes this a criminal. Okay. Let me try this one. Okay, so Lucian, let me ask you this question, right? Is there, in fact, interstate commerce with respect to drugs? Not, not with this case, but in general. Is there the interstate commerce with respect to drugs? 
Uh, yeah, everyone agrees that drugs are shipped across state lines, and that's interstate commerce. Right? No one, no one doubts that. But Scalia says, if Congress can regulate this interstate shipment of drugs, what can Congress do about this local problem? What can Congress do to make sure that their nationwide drug regime is effective? Good. Keep going. Only with our do so could undercut Good. Regulations Say it again loud, please. Only uh, only with failure to do so could undercut its regulations of interstate commerce. Very good. So Scalia says this. Local activity can be regulated, quote, as an essential part of a larger regulation of economic activity in which the regulatory scheme could be undercut unless the interstate activity were regulated. I said again. Local activity can be regulated as an essential part of a larger regulation of economic activity in which the regulatory scheme can be undercut unless the interstate activity were regulated. James, what does that mean? <coughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Sorry, I was writing notes. What, what was the question? What does that mean? As far as being... Um, I read it twice. What does that mean? I'll come back. Justin, what does that mean? What's Scalia saying there? As long as it interferes with state power. So let me ask you, Jim, Justin, what is the interstate commerce at issue here? There actually is interstate commerce. What is the interstate commerce at issue? Regulation of drug traffic. Between states, right? Right. Okay. Does Angel Rach's local marijuana plants interfere with that nationwide enforcement scheme? No. Well, what does Scalia think? Andrew? Uh, he thinks it does because the drugs would leave the state. And therefore, become interesting. Okay, very good. So let me explain this, right? You only get substantial effects if there's actually interstate commerce, right? Stevens gets interstate commerce by giving a very broad definition of economics, right? Very broad definition of economic activity. Mm -hmm. Scalia said, no, no, no. This is not about regulating the local weed. Congress has the power to regulate this national scheme, and therefore, they have extra power to go after local weed. I said again. Congress can regulate the interstate traffic of drugs, and as a necessary and proper means of doing so, they can go after local weed that undercuts the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I understand what I just said, right? If local activity can undercut an interstate market, then Congress can regulate it. If Congress has this interstate regulatory scheme, they can go after local activity, right? That allows Congress to regulate local activity because they have this national scheme. He said, look at Wickard, right? Congress had this general price fixing scheme to keep the prices elevated. That lets them go after local activity. So Scalia doesn't accept the Webster's third definition of economics, but he says that you can go after local activity if it undercuts the scheme. Okay. He finds that this is both a necessary and a proper exercise of federal power. Even though it intrudes on the state police power, it's both necessary and proper. Why? Because the regulation of local weed, I'm sorry, local weed, is an essential part of a comprehensive scheme of interstate activity, even though the activity itself does not substantially affect interstate commerce. One more time. The regulation of an intrastate activity may be an essential to a comprehensive regulation of interstate commerce, even though the interstate activity does not itself substantially affect interstate 
Thomas. So Scalia paves the way for this sort of commercial uh, uh, regulation, these economic schemes. He doesn't go full Stevens, but he goes commercial. So any questions on the Scalia uh, concurrence? All right, James, come back to you. What's Justice O'Connor's argument in her dissent? Well, just going back to the necessary and proper. Yes. Yep. That we're saying it's maybe necessary, but it's not proper to go the, the broad. Why is this not proper? Um, because they should leave that for the, the state. Okay, very good. O'Connor finds that this is an intrusion on state sovereignty. Why? If California wants to uh, 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 modify their police power to allow marijuana, they can do so. Justice O'Connor also rejects the broad definition of economic activity. She says it's a breathtaking, breathtaking definition. And if you have this phrase about commodities, there is no limit. Uh, she also wrote that the marijuana is never in the stream of commerce. I wonder where that phrase came from? Here. Before I got to Zipfra, it was in Kamal, right, stream of commerce. By the way, Connor wrote Asaki as well, if you remember. Ah, see? Mm -hmm. So she was familiar with that. She tortured law students for an old classes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and at the time, Justice Rehnquist, or Chief Justice Rehnquist, was quite ill. Uh, he wasn't pre present at the arguments. He died a few months later. So he just joined the O'Connor dissent. He, he was already checked out at this point. He should have retired much earlier. He was basically incapacitated his last year. Uh, it, it's a very sad story. You, you get to a certain age where you lose you lose your faculties, and then you have life tenure. You can't be forced to resign, so you stick around for way too long. Uh, it happens all the time. Okay, so, and then we have, in our brief time left, we have the Thomas concurrence. Uh, sorry, what is just Thomas's oh, dissent? I'm sorry. Yeah, Thomas doesn't concur here. What is Justice Thomas's dissent here, Sarah? Um, he thought that the court should have banned the substantial effects test yeah. altogether because it was Very good. So he, he's, 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 he's giving his same spiel that we just did ban the substantial effects test. He'll write this over and over again. Uh, eventually, someone will listen to it. Maybe not. Okay. Questions on the Thomas dissent or the O'Connor dissent? Okay. Let me bridge you now between Rach and your reading for next class, which is quite long, I admit. Uh, the, the Obama, was that? Yeah, it's <laughs> And the Obamacare dissent. Trust me, you're better off for it. Uh, <laughs> I don't, actually, sorry, it may change. I used to make you read the entirety of the uh, of the same-sex marriage decision. I, I removed that. But the last day of the class, we have the travel ban decision. So I always want you to read a full decision or two. It's, it's, good, for you. it's good for you. What was that? Good job. All right, so what happened? Rage was, what, 2003, right? <laughs> and FIB, was it free, right? Oh, oh my God, being old. Yeah, 2005. Rachel was 2005, and then Obamacare was 2012. So what happened between? It was a big debate, right? Was Lopez and Morrison a blip? No. Rachel pulled things back. Then you have replacements. Rehnquist is replaced by Roberts. O'Connor replaced by Salina. Would they continue the project of limiting federal power or not? <laughs> And the Obamacare decision basically brings together everything we study. It brings together commerce clause, right? Is a regulation of inactivity commerce? It brings together necessary and proper. In order to have this effective regulation of health care, can they go after inactivity? And it brings together the spending power. Can Congress impose strings on a state where they can lose a significant percentage of the budget? It's actually a perfect case. It's a culmination of our federalism study. And after an FIB, we go on to other stuff that's probably more relevant to you. Okay, any questions? Oh, yeah, Sergio. You did, you did mention, uh, let me see, the conditions for restricting on the spending power. This is like in Dakota, South Dakota. You said there were four, and then you said there was a fifth. The fifth is the coercion one, the pole, where, where the line where pressure turns into compulsion. That's a yeah? Guys, just, just, just for a minute. We have a minute left. Just let her, let her speak so it's not, not rustling the papers. Okay. Um, ask no, no, ask her now, please. Uh, they talk about the jurisdictional element, like yeah. a case by case assessment of whether it falls within it. Yeah. Um, 
Um, when you apply the test in breach, though, like, they don't care, right? No. That's like the... Because once, the once you get to economic in Webster's Dictionary, everything's economic, and the hook doesn't really matter much anymore. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I will see you all on Wednesday. Thank you so much.